Welcome to the Christian Indie Writers Podcast, where we inform, encourage, and support Christian indie writers on their journey toward publication. My name is Jamie Hirschberger. I write short fiction under the pen name J.R. Nichols. I'm Jennifer Carl Tong, and I write historical Christian romance. I'm Christina Katane, and I write in multiple genres, including Christian dystopian fiction. I'm Rhonda Hagerman, and I write fiction and nonfiction. Well, happy Friday, everybody. And I'm so happy for the little theme music that we've added to the podcast recently because it really helps me realize, oh, no, we're going live. And all of the weird stuff we are four separately doing can come to an end and we can kind of focus. Today's been a little wackadoodle already, hasn't it, ladies? Yes. So um, we're going to um, thank you, first of all, everybody who's watching um, on on YouTube right now live as well as on, I'm sorry, I've lost my outline. Jen even typed in there all of the places you can find us. Jen, do you want to tell me, tell our listeners where else they can find us besides YouTube? Oh, uh, any place that, you, that podcasts are found on Apple podcasts, on Spotify, on uh, Pandora. We are also on Google podcasts. We're everywhere that podcasts are found. Yeah. So I would like to ask a personal favor. If you love what we do here, if you look forward to joining us every Friday, spread the word because frankly, um, your friends are our audience. We seek to offer encouragement and support to writers on the journey to our publication and we are trying to grow. And we think that the great way to do that would be to have some recommendations. So go and leave us a review anywhere you hear us or see us and also tell your friends. Um, every episode, we go around the virtual table and say, what's up to everybody? Find out what's going on in their personal life. So what's up with you today, Jen? I was so hoping you didn't pick me first. <laughs> you had a look. I wasn't sure. <laughs> first Do you need of all, me to I want to skip you? No, Shell says, I love that I'm not the only one who uses the word wackadoodle. Did I say wackadoodle? <laughs> yep. You did. Oh, um, no. I don't know. I we just, might need one of those like filter button things if I'm saying stuff and not remembering like only two <laughs> minutes later. It's just kind oh, of no. fitting for what the, the, the precast, right? Like, oh, my it, word. We were crazy really, today. Nothing really funny was said, or at least it struck me as funny before we started. And I was like laughing through the whole introduction, like a, like those kind of laughs where I just can't stop. And then people forget why I'm even laughing. And that makes me laugh even harder. So <laughs> my, uh, <laughs> my what's up today is that, I don't know, I'm not prepared for this. I, uh, my friends had a couple, my daughters had a couple of their friends stay the night last night. They've been besties since birth. Literally, I have pictures of my two older daughters as babies playing with Aww. these girls and they just have grown up together and um, they stayed the night last night. We just had a lot of fun and we're going to do some baking today when How I get off fun. of here. So yeah, I'm excited. They're good kids and my kids are just good kids too. So this is going to be a good day. That's so awesome. Well, speaking of kids, I know Tina's still visiting with her daughter. I see you're at uh, Amber's house. Yep. I'm in her office so taking over the place. Well, what's um, your what's up for this week, Bambina? Well, this afternoon, I'm one, of, one of my really good friends is coming to visit, and we're going to have uh, Jesus Talks. So we'd like to get to have together and have uh, Jesus Talks. And I'm jealous. So she, she said we were overdue for one one, and I said, well, I don't have a car, but you're welcome to come on out. So she's coming Tina, on out. Isn't that, uh, didn't we talk about something called Haverim? Mm -hmm. Would you like to speak to that? Because I loved it when you explained it to me. Um, Haverim is a Jewish word that means... Friends that get together to um, hem and haw about the scriptures. That that root word actually means to hem and haw. Isn't that amazing? And in the in the Jewish culture, um, debating the scriptures is considered the highest form of worship. So, I'm so jealous that I'm missing out on some Havarim. So, but good I for really you. Wanna, I'm really excited about right after the podcast. I'm going to go over to the Facebook post on our Facebook page and figure out who the winner is of our write it better little oh, contest oh, for yeah. whom the winner gets bragging rights. Yeah. No. Well, maybe we can talk about that more in the what's next. Do you think that way I could keep it fresh in everyone's mind? 
Yeah, we could do that. And what do we have? What's up in the chat? I see Sage can't be with us, I guess. She's got some scheduled power outages. We miss her. We usually look for her. All right. Before we go on to the um, everybody's what's up, I just want to uh, introduce, we got a new chatter. Brian Crowther says, I'm Brian and I like pasta. Hi, Brian. Hi, Hi Brian. Oh, I like Brian. <laughs> yeah, so Brian Brian is one of our listeners that hangs out over at Facebook. Brian, as you see me sharing things from people, most of the people that I'm going to be sharing from that you're going to see on the screen here are over on YouTube uh, chatting. So it, you could go over there and meet them, or the, you can just meet them this way too. Robin says, my what's up? Writing, beta reading, proofreading for a charity <laughs> anthology about cats. I hate cats. <laughs> Why am I reading 50 <laughs> stories about cats? <laughs> Oh, Robin. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh. <laughs> I, I guess Robin and I can't be friends. It's for charity, Robin. You're you're doing it for charity. So give yourself a, a little pat on the charity doing back there. Good for you. All right. Um, is that it from the chat there, Jen? We should find out what's up with me then, I guess. Yep. I just got to say thanks, Shell. Shell went over to Facebook, even though she was already chatting in YouTube, to say hi to Brian. So oh, I love our community. Nice. Love you guys. Yeah, yeah. I know. We get so much good um, info in there. All right. So I decided to write down my what's up this week so I wouldn't forget because I always feel like what's up's kind of like show and tell. When I was really little, I got excited about show and tell, you know, and but then I forget when we have podcast day. You would think I would be excited, but I always somehow forget to prepare. So last week I went and wrote down that I wanted to share for show and tell that I finally looked up what burnt sienna is because when I was a kid, I would look at a crayon and I would say burnt sienna. And I liked the color. The color wasn't brown and the color wasn't orange, but I liked it. And um, I never knew what that was. So sienna um, is an earth pigment containing iron oxide and manganese outside. In its natural state, it is yellowish brown and is called raw sienna. When heated, it becomes reddish brown and becomes burnt sienna. And that is my what's up for this week. <laughs> I don't know, like these things that like I've wondered my whole life, why would I not look it up now that I have Google? When I was right. a kid and curious, how would I find that out? It's like encyclopedia. Like that's going to tell you burnt sienna. Yeah, There's going to be an will. entry. Will there yes. be an entry for Burton Sienna in the encyclopedia? Yes. There is? Yeah. No. Well, my friend down the street had, uh, her, her parents had a set of of encyclopedias, and I thought they were so rich. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wish I had a set. Oh, Sage is on. She says hey. she's drowning in client work and doing all the YouTube things. Yeah. Oh, oh cool. we have yeah. someone. We have uh, Gina T here today. Gina T. I don't see that one yet. Let's do Maria's and then we'll all look for Gina T. So Maria's what's up says carrying on editing done 12 pages this week. Yay. Wow. wow. Good for Making you. Progress at last. Also been doing more on Twitter. Good. And trying to edit my website. We're trying to up our social media too. So yeah, Maria, I've noticed you on social media. Good job. I've seen you commenting and liking and posting. I've noticed. So if I'm seeing you, people who are following you who haven't seen you in a while are noticing. Good yep. job. That is a good job. Shell says her what's up is writing every day and trying to get some traction on a new short story. Ooh. Awesome. Um, let's see. Barbie says difference between mm. the Sienna and the Umbers. Basically, one is warm. The other is cool. I got to admit, I thought Sienna was like wood. I thought when I was coming with Bert and Sienna that it was some kind of a wood that was burnt, right? Because it was mm -hmm. brown. So to even learn that it was like a pigment, like just actually a color or, or whatever. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. <laughs> Thanks, Barb, for looking at my starfish. Piper's driving, but she stopped to be able to chat with us. Piper, wow! you win. Oh, awesome. the best fan of the week. He wins. <laughs> he wins. She says driving stopped to add in here DIY kitchen project this weekend and like 3,000 words written this week wow, so far. Wow, that's Rock awesome. On. We that need to send really her cool. a certificate. Yeah. <laughs> of the week. Yes. Maybe I'll, I'll make something up and I'll put it on like on social media and tag her yes. at it. <laughs> fan that's of the week. awesome. Best fan who does not text and drive. And you yes. should have her, her comment in the yeah. in whatever it is. That's awesome. Well, we really appreciate you guys. Um, uh, keeping up and spreading the word about what we're doing over here and joining us. Oh, Gina T. Hello. 
Hi, Gina. Do we know Gina T? I think we do. So anyway, she's obviously not using her full name, so we won't either. Okay, so <laughs> anyhow, moving on to our topic du jour. Last week, you may recall, we got into describing characters, physical description. Can you say something else about a person besides what color their hair is or how tall they are, whatever? We talked all about that. So this week, we're doing part two of... Um, this series, and we're going to talk about physical um, locations and describing those in your writing. Who I picked on Jen last time, so someone else, maybe Rhonda or Tina, why do we want to consider physical descriptions of locales? Rhonda, how about you? Well, you know that I'm going to discuss mysteries. So um, really, in a mystery story, your setting can be a character. Um, you know, if you think of some um, Edward Allen or Edgar Allan Poe stories, you know, he has a house as a character and wow. it is a, you know, it's definitely a, um, story that keeps you gripped. Um, so the, the description can really change the mood or direct the mood of the story. Hmm. Um, that's so a very good point. So it can set like an eerie tone or, or like a bright and sunny day would make your, like the reader would feel maybe more positive if they were reading about a bright and sunny day, you're saying? Yes. Uh, and then something else, when you're describing the description, <clears throat> you may or may not gloss, well, you probably should, while you're describing it, gloss over a clue because oh. you need to make sure the clues start in the beginning of the story. So most of the descriptions in the beginning of the story. So if there's a clue that can be left in those descriptions, then mm -hmm. you need to include those to for continuity for the book. Well, I never thought about that in the context of mystery, Rhonda. You made some really excellent points. Um, how about you other ladies? Why is describing uh, setting important in other genres? Tina, I'm sure in what you write, setting is very important, physical description yeah. of the scenery. Yeah, in my book that I'm about to publish soon, um, setting is also like a character. And I was trying to think what character would I say that my setting is and I think it's like the sidekick because sometimes oh. it's very helpful and your best friend mm. and where you feel at home and sometimes it's your worst enemy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or ends up helping the enemy by accident. Right. Like you know, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So I don't know exactly what character it would be, but it is definitely like a character in my book and it's important. Mm -hmm. And like Rhonda said, it sets the mood. It sets the mm -hmm. um the pacing because if there's something you know if there's an avalanche and your character's running from an avalanche then that is going to set the pacing of the story mm -hmm. too so right. wow i had not ever really thought about the fact that setting can change both the mood and the pacing of your story right there those are two solid good takeaways and also to think of setting as another character in your book Okay, well, we can move on about talking about why it's important. Unless, Jen, would you like to discuss it? I mean, you're writing historical romance, so setting's going to be important right. if you're writing historical, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, like, I was just going to ask you guys if you all agree that it was probably, just like last week, you talked about how physical description is genre-specific. Like, for mm -hmm. me, as a romance writer, physical description is way more important than than other genres. Um, but I, I would say that I don't know that setting is as important to my genre as it is for sure not as important as it is to to mystery but um i don't know that it's as important because i could have two characters fall in love at a baseball game as easy and i could take the same characters in the same storyline and i could put them at a farm out in the middle of the country and it would it would be the same story but i think that i still have to have setting right otherwise it doesn't feel authentic like you want people to feel like they're there it seems like with romance and perhaps general fiction, the the setting then would be more like a seasoning to the story as opposed to like a major player or a, a whole nother character. So like in romance, you would use sprinklings of the setting to flavor the, the book in a certain way. So why is it a baseball romance? Well, because you use baseball descriptive you know what I'm saying? To like season the book. So the setting right. acts more of an enhancement as opposed to a vital, pivotal part of the book. Rhonda, what were you going to say? You had your hand up. Uh, something similar to what Jamie just said, but in romance, okay, so physical description for the characters, 
obviously, you know, you want to fall in love with them too. But in your historical romance, if I've got two books here, contemporary and historical, I'm going to say, well, my historical romance, I'm going to enjoy more because I know it's going to talk about historical things and the setting is going to be something I want to, you know, mm -hmm. I want to put myself in right now. Mm -hmm. so, right. People watch right. Little House on the Prairie for a reason. Right. I'm not, yeah, and I, I want to make it clear. I'm not saying the setting isn't important for what I do. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just trying to say that with your genre, every genre is going to look at it differently. Sure. And so, like mystery, it's part. I mean, it is part of the story for sure. Mm -hmm. For me, setting is important for historical accuracy, um, and for if it's a um, a plot point, often I the setting will be part of a plot point, and often to set the mood, like we talked about earlier. Like I use setting to set the mood a lot. Like in my um, book that I'm that Jamie's editing right now, when my main character steps out of the train the first time, like I talk about, which just very quickly, but that every like the everything is gray, like there's no white paint anymore, and everything just feels gray, and that's kind of like the setting, the feeling of this town that I was trying to set up. So, yeah, so it's important. I'm just saying it's not every genre. It's going to be a, have a different level of importance. I like yeah. what Brian Carruthers said. Uh, in the chat, he says, you can't have a scary murder tool shed without <laughs> describing it fully. All right. She's got yeah. a point. That's a fact. <laughs> oh, well, and then I see our fantasy writers. Oh, what does it oh. say here? Gina, Gina says, if Hallmark, Hallmark can do it anywhere, you can do it anywhere. That's true. <laughs> I feel like um, our our fantasy writers are chiming in, sort of saying that there's a lot of attention that you need to pay if you're writing a fantasy world. I can imagine they want to know what that shire looks like, or or whatever. They want to you to paint for them a beautiful picture of a scene that they can see in their mind. I believe. Um, would you guys agree that if you're doing fantasy, it's going to be majorly important? Yes. Yeah. Yes, especially if you have uh, some crazy world that doesn't um, look like ours. Uh, you you want your reader to know what it looks like. So sci-fi also, you may have to pay more attention. Okay, so we've covered that. Now, how do you guys use scene descriptions? Okay, we, we, we asked you all to kind of brainstorm what you were going to say. If I asked you each specifically about descriptive scenes of scenery, describing scenery in your own writing. So who wants to be first? How do you handle it in your own writing? I can go first. All right. But, but I'd like to point out that scenery and setting aren't necessarily the same thing. Because Ooh, setting can point. be scenery, but wow. it can also be a dark room where you can't see anything. Wow. <clears throat> so, Great, which would also be like a lack of scenery too, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so setting is just where your character, where the story is set at, at that moment, it's not necessarily, you know, there's not necessarily scenery to describe. So mm -hmm. um, I like to close my eyes and imagine the setting. And then, um, so the things I would imagine, is it outside? Uh, is it in a dark room? Um, what do I feel? What do I smell? Mm -hmm. What do I hear? Am I hot or cold? Am I on a hard cement floor or am I standing on squishy moss? And once I've done that, I decide which details I want to, in to include in the book. Because you don't need to include all those details. You just need enough to make your character feel and experience what you're feeling and experiencing. Um, so sometimes I choose to describe how a place makes me feel instead of the carpet was thick and tan and the walls were blue. I might say the room made me think of my grandma and how she always smelled of rose water and licorice. Mm. And, and that can set the scene because everybody has a grandma and everybody's grandma had that scent that brings them back to that room and where they experience their grandma. Mm. Well, most people do. So you don't really need to even describe the room because everybody's room might look different in that, but maybe that's not important to your story. Now, if it's important to the story to know that there's like one of those, um, lamps that has the shade made out of um, stained glass. Oh yeah, Tiffany. Then you might want to describe that. But if you just if you just need your your readers to feel like they're in the room with their grandma, then just how it makes you feel is sufficient. I love that you said that, Tina, because um, I know if anybody's been watching the podcast for any amount of time, they may have heard that I'm writing, I'm going to publish my first novel soon. And the challenge I've been having as a writer is getting the word count to something that people would consider a respectable length. 
But the temptation is to describe every item in the room because you think that you're helping like your word count or you're helping your reader to imagine the room. But this is where the artistry of writing comes in where you make intentional choices that maybe another writer wouldn't make. Would you ladies agree? Like that's where the art of writing comes in. Yes. Yeah. So you have to be selective. So uh, Rhonda, what's, what about description in your writing? What did you want to say about that? Well, what I do is- your, Oh, your Rhonda, mic can't hear you. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, uh, what I do is when I get ready to um, imagine a scene, you know, I've already got it outlined and everything. So I just sort of imagine it in my head. And then I think about what I'm seeing in there that my character would see. Basically what I do is I put myself in my character's shoes and not only at that time, but in the future in the book, because if I need to add something in there, my Chekhov's gun or whatever in the scene, I want to um, try to imagine all that at once. And then mm -hmm. of course I'll go back and revisit it through editing and all that. But um, I agree what you said about don't describe everything in the book because word count is not important uh, as long as the story is good. I mean, obviously you've got to have a certain word count for your genre or whatever or be in a um, general space of that word count. But don't just add description to boost your word count. Mm -hmm. Agree. All right, Jen, anything in the chat of, of Roger <clears throat> before I ask you for your um, descriptive writing strategy? Maria says, yeah, I, get, I try to give a lot of attention to my historical fiction novel set in Celtic Britain in the Lake District. Um, because it's historical. So so similar to what I do, I'm sure. Like maybe, um, though it's not, since it's not romance, maybe you got some more in there. I don't know. Um, no, I think we better, um, I think that's pretty much it. <laughs> well, I, I don't have much to say, which is why I was going to jump right to you, Jen. I mean, facts are facts. I need to use more descriptive writing in my books. I mean, when you guys were talking about setting the scene and setting the feeling, I realized that I have my character going into an unfamiliar place and he, he mentions a room that would be familiar to him, like a cafeteria, say. And I don't specifically describe it thinking, well, my readers know what a cafeteria is, but is there anything particularly interesting? Is he cold? Is he hot or not? I don't know. But these are things that I can think about a little bit differently. When my character encounters a new environment, what is different or, or remarkable? Because what I typically do is I tend to write what I see as the narrator. So if I'm in the head of my main character and my main character enters a room, I'm tracking with his eyeballs and this was this way and that was that way. And he might walk into a cafeteria and just be like, it's a cafeteria. So why would he point out? But maybe he's, maybe it's a little chilly in there or, or whatever. And I can think about where he is psychologically in his headspace and think if the setting might make him feel edgy. These are, these are details that build the character and make your audience appreciate him more. It's not just about the room. It's about the tension in the room, maybe making him feel reactive in a certain way. It's right. about the other people in the room putting off a certain energy, things like that, that you can capitalize on to also endear your character to the reader. Why do and you have like him walking we, in? Sorry. Just like last week, we said that um, what your character notices can tell you a lot about that character. It's the same thing with the setting. What the character notices about the setting can tell, can reveal a lot of stuff about your character. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Jim, what were you going to say? I mean, probably about, but basically the same thing is I was going to say, why do you have him going into the cafeteria? Why is he not walking into a men's bathroom? Or why is he not walking? Like, there's a reason you mm -hmm. have him going there. So th what I do, like, I hyper-focus on one or two things. I try to. Um, and so, but I the things I focus on, I make them count. I try to make them count in that chapter. So if I'm going to talk about, and you'll see in my sprint coming up, the setting sun, it's not just because the sun is setting. Like, why? Like, what is this? How is this moving my story forward? How is this going to give me insight into my character? So the same thing with your character. He's walking in this cafeteria. You could have him walk into anywhere. So there's a reason why. So is it the clanking? Is it is it symbolic of something in the story? Like you said, is it like, is it because he's nervous? Is he have to go there for a reason? Well, if there, that is, then you find something in that room 
that will help us feel like we're there. That's the whole point is you want your reader to feel like they are in that setting. Otherwise, we would never have to describe setting. We would just let them always pretend that the, the whole thing is happening in their living room, right? Yeah. So who I want to hear from is any of y'all either live uh, in the chat or on the podcast with me in the virtual room. What in the world about you people who have to edit down your book because you can't stop describing? Like, see, I've never been this person. I've always been the person where I write a short story and I would love to be a novelist, but I've got to figure out how to make more words. I I run into people all the time who have like 200,000 word epics that they're trying to like whittle down. Do we have any advice for people who just can't seem to figure out the sweet spot between overdoing it and actually putting in things that people will care about. You guys got any advice for those people? I mean, have you ever been there to where your work, you know, is just too long. And maybe if you chopped out some description that would help. I think if you can't see it, maybe it's time for an editor. Mm. Um, yes. Or if you were in my case, you don't want to send it to an editor and pay all that money for like when you know it's garbage. So you just go through again hyper focus on one or two things in the scene and take out everything that doesn't matter. Even if it's well-written, even if you just love it, or you just love like the, the interaction with the characters, whatever, if it doesn't move the story forward, if it, if you take it out in the, in this, the chapter still accomplishes the same thing, then that's what you have to take out. Yeah. And and you deserve your own certificate, Jennifer, because you killed a lot of darlings to get your most recent book to me. I know how many words was it to start? I was, oh, I was over 120,000 and it wasn't anywhere near the end. I didn't have an end or anything. It was just, it was like I was writing episodes for Little House on the Prairie or something. <laughs> Tina's you know, when, hand. What's up, Tina? When um, you take a writing course, say in college or online or wherever you take writing courses, they always have this exercise where you write a 1500 word piece. And then the next assignment is to whittle down that piece to 500 words. And then the next assignment is to whittle it down to 250. So if you're really struggling with your novel that you want to publish, maybe try doing one of those exercises. Just write a 1,500 word short thing and then practice whittling it down by taking out the most important thing. And I think that you can get into that practice and then that will help you when you go to do that with your big thing. We can probably have a whole episode on things that you could just automatically go through and whack out of your manuscript. But um, I don't want to start any controversies right now, but there are some where I'm just like, wham, wham, gone, gone, you know? So um, anyway, uh, Maria says, go ahead, Jen. For me, I think it is of it in terms of plot, trying to balance it. So my characters travel to another kingdom. So I describe the road along the well, way. Well, there you go. Mm-hmm. I like to describe it so the reader can imagine where the characters are going, but not so much take the reader out of what's going on. Yeah. yeah. That is a great, great uh, way of, um, of putting it. Like you don't want to describe so much that you've left the story now, or at least left the action or what's happening in the story. But the description has to somehow move that story forward. Love that. All right. Well, Barbie's commenting about the drabble. She says, whittle down like the drabble. So we can just kind of maybe do a little reminder right now that we are having a special write a drabble contest for our 100th episode. A drabble is 100 words exactly. No more, no less. 100 words. The topic is open. Um, Jen, how do they get our attention and our eyeballs on their drabble? Well, first of all, you can enter the contest to win. We've got lots of prizes for you. Swag, swag, swag. We've got, <laughs> uh, you can get yourself an official Christian Indie Writers podcast mug, which are no, not available for purchase. You'll be the only purchase. person besides us that has one. Right. They're not available for purchase yet. You can get uh, Christian Indie Writers podcast coasters handcrafted by none other than Christina Katane. A signed <laughs> copy of Avoiding Esther by Jennifer Carl Tong. A signed copy of Second Chance by J.R. Nichols, and a signed copy of Plot Your Novel with This Workbook by D.D. D. Bauman. And Very to do that, nice. do that. You go to our website at christianindiewriters.net forward slash episode 100. That's the word episode and 100. Zero, zero. No dashes or anything. So that would be where you go to enter. And then if when you write the Drabble, here, that's the, the contest. The Drabble is in addition to that, you, you'll get one entry for writing a Drabble, but we also are going to be selecting a few Drabbles of your of our listeners to share on the podcast next Friday. So if you want that included, 
do a screenshot of your Drabble and either on Instagram or Twitter, even on Facebook, tag us in it so that we see it and uh, we'll retweet it. So if we don't retweet it, it means we haven't seen it. So uh, reach out to us. Um, then we will cho randomly choose a few to share live on our 100th episode, which is next Friday. I have a question, which maybe we should have clarified off air, but like, hypothetically speaking, if someone had already written a hundred word Drabble that they've never published anywhere, would they be able to submit that for this contest? Hypothetically no. speaking, uh, yeah. when does it have to have been written? Like since we, since we uh. <laughs> I would say anyone who's listening, if they've already written a Drabble, yes, they can enter it. If your name is J.R. Nichols, no, no, <laughs> you are not allowed to enter. You have to write a new one. Uh, all right. That's fine. You're the, uh, what is the deadline for the Drabble? That's a really good point. The deadline for the Drabble is, um, I think Thursday. That's a good question. Shall I should have the answer to that. And I don't know. It's our second. first time. Have mercy. It's the first time we've ever tried to do any kind of a contest or giveaway or anything. And I cannot even explain to you the Keystone Cop fiasco that it was to sort of put this one together. So we really apologize if y'all are having a hard time finding details and stuff. We're going to get better. But I let's have, face I have it. the answer now. <laughs> I have the answer now. I'm really sorry. Uh, by 12 a.m. Eastern time on the 18th which is next Tuesday. That gives us time to um, write our own. Look them. So the whole contest ends then. So you want to enter to get this great swag opportunity from none other than the Christian Indie Writers Podcast. Swag that's not available anywhere else. What time is the deadline? 12 a.m. So, at, so at 11 p.m. on August 17th, Tina and Ron and I will be doing a live sprint <laughs> writing a Drabble together we are. probably well i mean probably oh. not we'll I'll be secretly writing oh uh gigi says she already submitted a drabble yes. i can't Ooh. wait to see it yes, i haven't seen did. it i uh, we've have a we've had a, a few of them already submitted i'd love for you uh is that good it's good for the yes it's for the entry we would like you to tweet it or something so that we can share it with the world and help support your social media yeah. as well. But Listen, okay. guys, help us help you. I mean, we're doing this stuff to encourage you to put things on your own social media platform. Like, like okay, if you want to be a writer and you want to be an, an indie writer and you want to sell books, you have to have a social media platform. So why not put this Drabble on there? You have to start, especially if you've just finished a book and you're going to be publishing soon. Start building that platform with this work you're already doing anyway. Keep it organic by farming from your other social media sources. <laughs> That's an inside joke if you have been go using, uh, going to our newsletter chat on Tuesdays. But Brian asked, did you get mine? Okay, Brian, I saw that you put it as a comment onto, I think it was one of our lives on Facebook. I need it as something separate. So um, if you go to 100 or episode 100, christianindywriters.net, forward slash episode 100. You can also copy and paste it into that where, where that's an option. Um, if not, then if you could do a screenshot and, um, and send it to us, that would be helpful as well. So, but I will try to remember if you don't do those, I will still try to remember that you did enter one. I'll try to, but it's hard yeah, I mean, it, if our it's not in our feed in a regular way. Like if it's not coming in one of those ways, it's hard for us to keep track of everything. So I will try though. Yeah, because there's a whole lot coming at us. <laughs> but we do appreciate you guys. And we wanted to give back to you all in some kind of a way. And this is our little homemade, you know, contest. And we really appreciate your grace and patience with it because we're not fancy. We, we only have the skills that we have. And so we really appreciate you. And we hope that it'll inspire you to write something super fun. I mean, a hundred word contest. What a puzzle. What a challenge. Like a Sudoku, only better. Okay, so now we're going to talk about, oh, the feeding of the backs. Yay, like my favorite part of the day. So um, Jennifer, I always pick you to go first. So what we do is we set a timer for 15 minutes and then we read the pieces live on the air without any editing beforehand. Um, are you okay, uh, Jen, to go? Mm -hmm, I'm go good. Ahead. I am good. All right, so today's sprint prompt was, 
She had never seen a place so beautiful. You had to include mm. that sentence in your sprint. Mine's very short because I crafted it. And I thought if I'm going to do this, and I know that there's some advice that I'm going to give during the podcast about what I think a person should do if they're writing setting, then I should probably try to include that in my sprint. So let's see if it came through that way. All right. She had never seen a place so beautiful. Calm turquoise waters gently lapped against the silky sand, beckoning her toes to wriggle in its cool embrace. Wave after gentle wave splashed over her feet, tickling her skin with the cleansing sensation that only Lake Michigan could offer. Macy had been to the ocean before, on quite a few occasions, in fact, but it paled in comparison to this majestic lake. As far as the eye could see, crystal waters covered the horizon, reflections of pink and orange dancing around across its surface, rivaling the sky's own display in imitation. True, without the sky, there would be no sunset to reflect. But without this great lake, would the sunset be anything more than just day turning to night? No, Macy mused. Sunsets were far more beautiful here than anywhere. And that is thanks to the lake. She wondered if that is how the world saw her. Was her beauty, her value to this world, only considered lovely because of who she was married to? If not for her husband and the fame that came with his occupation, would anyone take a second glance at her? Or was she much like the setting sun? only noticeable because of the vastness of her spouse reflected what little she had to offer. Macy curled her toes in the sand and watched the water sun continue its departure. Ooh, she's really got some stuff going on. Very Mm. good. Excellent description of Lake Michigan. That was really great. So beautiful there. If you, you guys like, it's beautiful. I Mm -hmm. can feel the water on my, feet and my ankles. Mm-hmm. I love that part. Mm-hmm. Thanks. So I really like- liked how you um, showed us how the setting related to her, to the character too, and not just mm-hmm. the setting. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Because I feel that's important in what kind of work I do. Like the setting needs to, there needs to be a purpose for it. Um, I also, I mean, I talked about her toes in the water and then I ended with her toes in the water, which is a framing thing, which is a, a, something I like to do. I think is a, a good thing. Um, but do you see how I hyper focus? Like you guys said, oh, it sounds just like Lake Michigan, but you, you've all been to Lake Michigan. Mm-hmm. There's so much more to Lake Michigan yeah. than what I described. There's mm-hmm. so much more. And like for people, they're like, oh, people in Michigan, when other people say, oh, but the ocean, no, you don't <laughs> understand. The ocean, yes, it's beautiful, but like Lake Michigan, salt free, and it's just the water is clear Shark everywhere. Free. It's what? Shark free. Shark free. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like there's no dangers in it. Like that. Unless you and- listen to the conspiracy theorists. The oh, wow. Great Lakes. The Great Lakes are your guys' reward for your seven month gray blanket. You guys <laughs> have the beautiful lakes up there. Yes. They're so amazing. If you go to Michigan in the summertime, you will want to live there forever. <laughs> Shiju says, Jennifer, that was such a beautiful description. Upstage by the <laughs> little cutie puppy behind you. And the stage said, sorry, I got distracted by Popper. That was lovely. It's so cute. He's walking around. His tail is wagging. Is that Sophia or, or Sassy? Both of them are back here. So I'm not sure which one it was, whether it was Sophia or Toby. Toby. But they both have like complete quarantine hair. I've got to get them. I've got, yeah, they're bad. So they're we not- have cute dogs on our podcast. I don't know why we don't take more advantage of them. Rhonda <laughs> refuses to be a stage mom for Teddy. We keep trying to get her to put like little costumes on Teddy. Cause it's like totally this little Pomeranian. That's so adorable, but she, she won't like, use her dog to get us ratings. <laughs> Unlike Jennifer, who's obviously planned all of this. Look at Sophia. Sophia's fighting with the blanket because she's spinning around and wants to I'm lay glad on she's the not like pooping. Like she was kind of doing oh. a squatty <laughs> thing. And I'm like, oh my gosh, Jennifer, is the dog actually evacuating? No. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a callback. I, I used evacuating. Yeah. I, I used evacuating in the precast and Jennifer's <laughs> cracking up. So. All and right. Anyway, we're, with this, the ah, we're getting off track. Bunny trail. We haven't done this in a long time, guys. We're really okay. Back on track. Okay. Whoop. All right. So, yay. All right, Jennifer. Great story. And thank you all thank for you. the encouraging feedback in the comments. Because again, we do not edit these. We want to read yours. Send us your sprint. Put it on your social media, guys. We're giving you little fun things to do that you can post and show the world what your writing's all about. Do it. Do it. I also have a sunset in my story. Ooh, we should Isn't have you go story? next then. Gina, Gina T said, go ahead, Jen. Gina wants everyone to know that she's bought costumes for Teddy. <laughs> so we need to see Gina the costume. T, Gina T can come over and like, like she can be the one and then Rhonda can just post them. So Gina, you, 
you do the Teddy pictures and then tell your mom she's got to put them up. So it can be a, a team effort. Teddy. 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 Oh, my word. <laughs> Robin Teddy also says, go. wait, you guys have puppies and haven't shared them with us before this? Just says, how rude. Oh, man, it's so <laughs> funny. So funny. Sorry, guys. Yes, we've been hogging our puppers. We'll have to share. I shared my bunny, I'm pretty sure. You did. You were really good with the Charlie news. So speaking of Charlie and, and just you in general, since you drew my attention to that corner of the screen, Tina, we have to move on. What is your sprint today? Okay. Here we go. She had never seen a place so beautiful. The sunlight sparkled off the snow, and if you looked close enough, you could see purples, reds, and greens dancing in the twinkling light of each individual flake. The mountains stood high against the cornflower sky, the patches of rock and spruce trees on their slopes, black against the snow. One might think that being in the Alaskan wilderness in deep midwinter would be a dismal place, painted in white, gray, and black, but they would be wrong. During those few hours of daylight when the sun shone down on this frozen part of the world, Colors, though few, were bright and vivid. The deep green of the spruce needles against the blanket of white brought to mind Christmases past, spent in town, where tinsel sparkled with the same colors sparkling off the snow now. The piney smell of the tree sap added to the Christmas feel. The blue of the sky changed as the sun made its way along the horizon, dropping ever lower toward the mountaintops, slowly painting the sky a soft pink, then deep salmon, before transitioning to purple streaked with orange. One would watch the sunset here in a way a new parent would watch their sleeping newborn, trying to soak in every detail, remember the smell of the spruce, the anemic warmth of the sun on their cheeks, the colors in the snow as it sparkled. They would treasure these memories, hold them close and keep them, so that then, in the darkness of the coming night, they could hold them in their hands and look at them, caress them, smile and remember, and that would give them courage and determination to make it through to the next sunrise. Lay in her okay, furs before I am a not crackling fire. She set her teacup on a hearth to keep it warm, pulled her woolen hat down over her ears and closed her eyes. Maybe tonight she would dream of warmer times, happier times, when she ran in the sunshine with him by her side. Oh, Tina, that is so good. I'm not reading word. mine. Like <laughs> mic drop right there. You know, like the end of your lesson on physical mm. environment description. Yeah. Cornflower blue sky. Like yes. I was stuck there and, and the beautiful things just kept racing past. I couldn't even grab them fast enough to point out the beautiful imagery that you did there. It's amazing. And I love how, you know, people always think, oh, snow is white. Snow is not white. Like the way you described it is exactly how I see snow. I mean, yes, it's white, but like, that's just the base color of it. Right. And you just yeah, Barb. Yeah, Barb grabbed anemic warmth. And sorry, but that was yes. one of the ones. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Jennifer. But once no. she, I saw it in the chat, I was like, yeah, the anemic warmth of the sun. Oh, mm -hmm. so good. Okay, it was really good. And uh, Tina, I hope you know, it, the comments are blowing up in support of that piece. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I love that you wrapped it up at the ending with something delicious about your character without him. Ooh, now there's intrigue also. Like, yeah. this is definitely a very gripping um, beginning of something, I think. And that's exactly what we were talking about, about taking the setting and making it part of the story, like the, like using it to move your story forward or show us something about your character or their internal. Yeah, exactly what you were saying. Perfect. Thank All right, guys. Rhonda, I'll go next. Um, <laughs> I, I really feel like I failed. Well, I straight up said to you all, I need to use more descriptive like scenery stuff. And to be quite honest, being as I was typing this live, whoever was watching, I wasn't really thinking about anything but making sure that I was actually typing. So I I sort of didn't do a very descriptive-y descriptive thing, but maybe you guys will like it anyway for the sake of the story. Look, I wrote today, right? I can say I wrote today. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Katerina turned the ring over in her hand. It was the last thing her grandmother had given her before leaving for the new world, a world Katerina now believed she would never see with her own eyes, large and brown like her Nana's. She slipped the ring onto her finger and the stone swung to hang like a swinging peach on a skinny branch. It would be years before she would be able to wear it, she knew, but all good things came in their time, Nana always said. Rena, lunch! Her mother had finished the chores early. She would be in a good mood. 
Katerina slipped the ring back into its black velvet box and tucked it into her apron pocket. Tell me about Nana, she said when she'd grown tired of pushing her spaghettios around in the bowl and they'd started to remind her of the secret she had stashed beneath the table. Her mother grumbled as she always did about not having time to sit and chew fat, but perched as she always did on the cracked yellow vinyl of her combination step stool and bar chair, removed her kerchief and shook out her hair with one of her large capable hands. Your grandmother is dead to me, she said, in a tone that was supposed to let Katerina know she did not care one bit, but Katerina knew she cared. She cared about Nana's ring. She had to go, Mama. She took a trip with Grandpa there to a place called Kentucky. She said she had never seen a place so beautiful. You know where is a more beautiful place? Mama snapped her kerchief. The most beautiful place is where your family is. She was off then about Grandma's obligations to the family, the vacuum she had left in the community. But she never said a word about any of Grandma's dreams. I went to my room and pulled out the little velvet box out of my pocket. I squeezed as hard as I could and prayed that Grandma was thinking of me, perhaps while plucking something exotic from the skinny gnarled branch of a Kentucky fruit tree. Aw, Grandma's dreams. That was so good. It was Thanks. very, very good. There was enough description there for me. Great. I'm pretty sure my grandma had that same chair. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you're saying about that you didn't really follow the rules or like you didn't really do the pro but it's beautiful writing. Like well, thank you. Is, I appreciate it. Like absolutely gorgeous. So like and if that was is it part of a story or you just came up with that? Like that's yeah, not just, something you're gonna use. Mark said go blah. Yeah. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Love it. Um, so how did, when you were trying to, when you're writing, were you saying, oh no, I need to add more setting in here? Or did you, how did that factor in while you were writing? It didn't because I was like, oh my gosh, people are right watching. So I oh. had to just write. Do you know what I mean? Like yep. yeah. it was an added element to the, you have 20 minutes to produce something, you know? So I totally forgot that the assignment was like, focus on the physical setting. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I just took the prompt and yeah. got inspired by it. So Okay, so let's let's pretend it, only because for like learning purposes. If you were now, to, if this was something you were going to keep, but you knew you had to follow the rules, what would you go back and would there be something you would tweak in order to add more setting? Well, what I would do now, going back as an editor, if the person was telling me they wish that there was more description, I probably would focus on that stone and more about a peach and more. You know, I would mm -hmm. kind of be more like groves and wavy trees and what she would imagine Kentucky would be like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. To yeah. kind of make it more because the story is about the ring, but it's about peaches have stones. You know what I mean? That's why I thought of a peach. Mm, I don't know. Yeah. So it's kind mm. of all very thematic that way for me. So I yeah. would go more into that kind of descriptive language. You know what I was thinking about for you, but this is not scenery, but it was like what we talked about last week. Like if you were to, fo you mentioned the strong, the large but capable hands of her mother, right? Mm -hmm. and her mother is talking about the, her grandma's responsibility and like that. And you could like really focus on her mom's hands and the wrinkles and the dryness because she, she, in what she's doing with it, you know, because that's responsibility uh, in contrast to what she's saying that the grandmother is doing. Do you know what I'm saying? It's so funny you said that because I, I stopped. If you watch the sprint, I stopped when I talked about the mother's hands because I almost made them small. But then I realized that her hands were small, which made her different than her mother. And sometimes mothers and daughters have problems because of their differences. So yeah. I thought it would be important that mother's hands would be different than hers. So yeah. I'm so glad you recognize that that would be a place because I did want to say about the wrinkles and the, because when I was a little girl, I told my mother, I loved the wrinkles in her hands. And she thought that was so special because to me, it was like, those hands are my mama's hands. You know what I mean? Yeah. So anyway, I'm really excited when people catch something in what I write. Thanks. I'm all goosebumpy on this too, because like you think about it, it's like that, it's such a contrast. That would be a way for you to show that this woman is all about responsibility and taking care of business without saying, well, my mom's always about responsibility and taking care. You don't, the mm -hmm. character doesn't say that. She focuses on the hands. And so, but yeah, but that. it's a spaghetti -o lunch. I bet grandma wouldn't have made a spaghetti -o lunch. Just saying. Oh, yeah. Just saying. Stephanie said, wow, Jamie, I could visualize the scene. How do you guys come up with these wonderful ideas? <clears throat> Something uh, happens practice, when the timer practice, says go. Practice. <laughs> practice. Yeah. Set the timer and just do it and you'll be surprised what comes out. 
Shell says you, so much story packed in such a brief sprint. Sorry, go ahead, Tina. If you go back and look at our ones when we first started, like you can see the progression. The, the more we do it, the more naturally it comes. Mm -hmm. Barb says, Jamie, you can't force what's not you. Sparse description is mm -hmm. fine. As long as you don't add more later, that will destroy the reader's vision. I agree with that. Like, I think that you need to be the writer that you are. But then when you find that there is an area that you're weak in, you can always go back and, and again, practice, right? We can practice being better about description. So. Right. And those things that we were talking about, the hands, the peach, the stone are things only I see in the piece. Do you understand? So, so you have to do that work yourself, writer. You can't hand your piece to someone else and, and have someone else tell you what is important to the piece. You right. can't, it's your work. It's your art. Like that is what people don't understand. An editor can only give you a suggestion. It can be something like X, Y, Z, but you have to go in and put the old, you know, Jane, plain Jane spin, whoever you are on your work. And if the peach stone, if that's important, then that's where you want to settle. Yeah. That's where you want to stop for a moment and, and, and focus on that hyper-focus, like I said earlier. So good stuff, Jamie, as always. Well, thanks. All right. Well, we got Rhonda down in this corner. People keep saying Teddy in the chat. I know. I are you petting a, the dog? Is Teddy making appearances? Okay, well, after you guys read yours, I realized I needed any bonus that I could possibly get. <laughs> so, Teddy is my co-reader. <laughs> and, yes, she's been in my lap for like three minutes, and I've been 100% distracted. So, that's why <laughs> she's not in my lap Aww. when I do the podcast. Right? Right, Teddy? Aw. Okay, Rhonda. See, already you're like. I, I say I that you read your story in the voice you just spoke to Teddy with. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Go ahead. No. Okay. All right. Um, I, I didn't quite get into the description I wanted to, but I mean, it was a good exercise for me. The tour bus lumbered along the steep inclines. The passengers were all caught up in their own rendition of 99 bottles where they replaced the word here <laughs> with whatever unusual thing they saw. Most recently being a herd of cows with, from Becky's experience, unusually long red hair. 99 hair goes on the wall. Barney, the tour guide, prompted the group to start again with his exaggerated swinging arm motions. And being good sports, they all joined in. Becky looked out the window as she mouthed along to the words. It was hard to concentrate on the silly song with all this breathtaking countryside around her. She'd never seen something so beautiful. The craggy hills looked like they were carpeted with a chartreuse low nap carpet with ribbons of thin white waterfalls decorating it. She peered at the tiny white dots halfway up the hills. Rocks snow? She gasped, no. She was witnessing her first real Scottish wildlife. The end. Wow. wow. <laughs> I love the chartreuse carpet with yes. waterfalls. Ooh. Yeah, that was what I was going to say, too. That was awesome. Like, so hyper-focused, right? You pick yeah. one thing. You didn't tell us everything that she was seeing out of the window, but we're right. there. Just by hyper-focusing, we saw everything you were seeing. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Good. You could have been in Alaska instead of Scotland. Like, I felt... Oh, really? Like, I think I've been, like, through a valley like that on the uh -huh. way somewhere. Well, you know, um, probably it was really similar, except in Scotland, there's no, very few trees on the mountains. And Alaska would have the trees, but, yeah, it would be the same. Some of them, yeah. Yeah. This is my face as Rhonda has, you know, tales to tell of her trip to Scotland. Someday I, too, shall have tales to tell of my trip to Scotland. Uh, yes. I'm Someday. Mm-hmm. Let's go see these sheep in real life. I love well, that. I love how. Yeah, I love that. Um, you were saying different things in the 99 bottles of whatever on the wall. It's so funny. Mm -hmm. I think everybody has sung that song on a bus at some point. I think so. Yes. And I could tell immediately that you were some that your character was someplace unfamiliar without you saying that, because when you talked about the cows, you you said in her recollection or something like that, that they how different they were. Mm -hmm. So that means like so she's seen something completely different. And I love that. That was really good. Thank you. All right. So um, Maria every... just invited all of us to her house. <gasps> yeah. Send us, send us oh, address, hey. Maria. We're there next week. 100th episode. <laughs> Celebration. <laughs> we'll, we'll celebrate the 100th episode in the UK with Maria. So. Okay. What? It's like a six hour flight. So, um, okay. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you have enough beds for all of us. Yeah, I got to bring my girls with me too. So I hope you have lots of beds. I heard something about a full English breakfast. I, yeah. I, I've heard of that, right? Wouldn't you guys yeah. like to try that while we're there? Real authentic. I just want to try our scones. 
I just feed me. Just feed yeah. me when I show up. That's me. <laughs> I'll eat anything. <laughs> I love food. Just don't then, give me no mushy peas. Okay. Sis. She said, um, <laughs> um, I said the UK now specifically by <laughs> house. <laughs> Oh, Shell says, right in your cheek. Funny you should say that, Shell, because we have been talking over the past year or so about the possibility of us hosting a writing retreat. So uh, we'd love to hear what you guys think about that. And um, yeah, it's something we yeah, would love like, to do. What because, would you want? I mean, you know. Because it's that's really kind of uh, what we, the four of us, do together or have done together. And it really makes a difference in your, the work that you're doing at that time. So let's anyways. just be honest, though. We need everybody to tell us exactly what they want it to be like. And then we just do whatever we're not too lazy to do. And that's what you guys will get. <laughs> um, not to be rude, but I mean, we can't help it. We're very busy. Do you know what I'm saying? So like right. anything we put together is the very best we can do. And be, we're doing it because we want to meet you, not because well, we're fancy. Well, plus <laughs> well, we want to and we want to help. So it needs to be yeah. something that would be good. Plus, cheap. We, are we also, want to be cheap. That's what I was going to say. We are also like very much against um, things that are overpriced. But when you look into doing a retreat, it would still be expensive. So it, that would be something too, like that we would have to balance the quality of it with the cost too. So. Yeah, we want it to be worth it for you to travel because a lot of you be traveling from far away. But anyway, that's a future plan. Hey, I like the word inexpensive better than cheap. <laughs> it's not going to be cheap. It's going to be it's inexpensive. Not gonna it's going to be, be a bargain. It's going to be a bargain for the quality you get. That's what we want. That's what we yeah. would strive yeah. for. All right. Well, we are um, just about out of time for the podcast, but we still need to make one more trip one around the virtual round table and talk about what's next. Okay. So we want to talk about your writing goals, your plans for the week, or if you're taking a break from writing to take care of your mental health or for some other reason we want to hear about that too what's next for you this week bambina um well i am on the last chapter of my yellow edits for my manuscript <gasps> Yay. So, the last chapter well, wow there's a lot more of them in there than i thought but <laughs> i am confident that i will have that done by next week and then go through and do like um kind of a, a quick edit kind of thing where you go through and, you know, I put a lot of more stuff in there. So I'm going to have to look at, uh, look at it again, just to go through it quickly. And then I'll be ready for the proofreader. Tina, the way that you are writing lately, I just can't wait to see what you've done with these edits because they're, I mean, if you're writing the way that you're writing in that sprint earlier today, then they're all going to be everything I dreamed that they would be. And they make your novel just be exceptional. I'm so excited to get my hands on this book. Well, I hope so. Well, also, mm -hmm. I'm about to go over to our Facebook page and count the hearts on everybody's Write It Better. Ooh. So we're going to see who the winner is, and I will uh, I will post an announcement on our Facebook page. So you guys want to all go over there and check it out. If I have not hearted yours, I will race over right away. I did not understand the rules, everybody, and I would like to heart everybody. So if I did not, that is why. That I don't think help. I hearted my own. If you heart everybody's, then like everybody will have the same score. I so. know. So we, we need non-participants to go over and vote too. I so that, that Yes. Uh -huh. And if there's a tie, then the I'm going to break the tie by looking to see who most closely follow our, our advice from our last episode. Ooh. Mm. So um, number one thing that we said was that looking in the mirror was a cliche. So anybody that didn't put the mirror in their piece <sighs> is going to ask the app is going to have um, bonus points. Tina, we all love you, but you have been upstaged. <laughs> I'm sorry, Rhonda. See, this is why we don't let Rhonda have the dog in her lap during the podcast, because that is completely unnecessary, but I guess necessary because my little heart is just overflowing. Um, Tina, yes. So you also posted a new entry into that contest, didn't you? Recently, is there a new one up, or was that? A no, I'm going to do that today. Awesome. I'll do that later today for next, and then we'll do. I'll do one every Friday after the podcast, and it's going to be related to the podcast. So you're going to want to take notes, maybe, so, because that's going to determine how what you do. So. Ooh, very good. All right, how is uh, how is Rhonda's week shaping up in Teddy's? Teddy's getting belly rubs, I guess, this week. Rhonda, you're muted, so we can't even hear you. Jen, do you want to hit the chat All while? Right. Uh, yeah, let me hit the chat. 
So Maria says her what's next is that she's having a couple weeks off with the hubby. Uh, she's going to probably miss the 100th episode because we are way Aww. busy friends. Oh, that's okay. You can, you can still enter the Drabble. You can still, you can enter still it. watch it later. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll be curious to see what your plans are while you're traveling to try to keep up that social media stride you've hit recently. Eee. Gigi says, what's up? I finished my manuscript yesterday evening. Yay! At Yay! That's a That's big That's such win. a good feeling. Yeah, right. good for you, Gigi. That's such a huge one. William J says, what's next? Final touch-ups on my website. Should be done by next week. Good job. Good Sa job. Sorry. Sage says, next week, all the work, all the play, none of the sleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I hear you. Sleep's uh, overrated. Shell says, what's next? Got to get the drabble done. Yes. And Maria says, what's next? Christian Indie Writers host plan. <laughs> A writing retreat in the UK. <laughs> hey, All right. Uh, did, I'm on board. Did we, did we scroll over Sage's invitation to South Africa? Because that's yeah, I'm waiting for that also. Oh, I'm let me go back and try to find that one. Okay. It's All gotta right. be here. It's gotta be here. Somewhere. I'm sorry, maybe, but I was too distracted by Teddy like dying of happiness from being petted. She was like, eh, and she just fell over from delight. So that's hilarious. <laughs> All right, limp noodle dog. Um, Rhonda, do we have your what's next now that you're not muted? Um, my next what? A little bit. <laughs> next what? Teddy's yeah. got her discombobulated. Yes. I know. She's just so cute. Okay. Um, <laughs> my what's next is I am reorganizing my office. I've got some new furniture and I am so excited to have everything in like an adult office. Yay. I can't wait. And I'm so excited. Of course, my writing and all that, but I just, I'm so excited. Well, better. put some pictures up on your yeah. Insta or something oh, so we can see what you do for your office. And if any of you all have pictures of your own home office, that's a great thing to put on oh, your yeah. um, social media me. feed. Mm -hmm. Inspire everybody. Inspire your fellow writers to dedicate a workspace for themselves. It'll make you very more productive. Make Help others become more productive as well. Who's next with the what's next? Who did I already talk about? Um, I'll share my not twext. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing. So um, I am going to, I still have to get, I've given Jamie 10 chapters and I have, uh, I got to get the rest of the chapters to her, which I'm hoping to work on this weekend, just so that I have that off my plate. Um, Cause she's not done to gone through 10 yet, but she's close. She's going fast. So, um, but um, I opened up one of the chapters and it was a sea of red. <laughs> so I, I did it. change some of my editing things to a different color, which will help you feel. But really, Jen, it's like it's you're going to it's fine. You're going to breeze through it. You're not going to believe how easy. Yeah, I'm. I'm yeah, I'm not worried. So, <laughs> well, I mean, I am worried. But so I'm on Monday. I am going to crack open Sarah's story and Ooh. start working through that to um, get it ready to, to go to Jamie, because. My plan is Sarah's story is kind of a Christmas story. It kind of, it has Christmas happening in it. And so uh, I don't want to release that in February. So my plan is to work my butt off and get both these books out before the end of the year. Can wow. you do it? Yes, you can. You can do Button it. Button chair. Huh? That's how you do it. Button chair. That's how you do it. So there's yeah. four sisters in your series. Did you say this is your favorite sister? Is that what you've said? I love this couple. Yeah. I love Will. I love, um, yeah, I, I, they probably are my favorite of all. Will and Phoebe I love or Sarah, them, which ones? Cause you Will said Will. Oh, uh, Will and Phoebe I are do love, favorite. But I also do love Sarah and Grant. Like I, I just can't wait. Like I, I hope you guys all love them as much as I do. So yeah. Um, head over. Um, do you have anything pinned about those guys? You could go over and look at all of Jen's stuff. So, and her books mm -hmm. are available, Jen. Oh, everywhere that books are sold. Amazon, <laughs> Barnes and Noble, possibly your local Christian bookstore, maybe even your library. Cause I, did I share that in the podcast that no, that, um, a friend of mine, a, a relative that they ran to at a funeral said, Oh, I saw that you posted something. And I went to my library, um, and I could, didn't have the books. So I had them order them. So now this library somewhere has my books that That's I didn't have so to do anything great. to get them in there. So wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Awesome. Exciting. It's fun. So what a win. Sharing, so when pe when sharing stuff, when you share stuff, it makes a difference. Like on Facebook, whatever, because uh, lots of people see it that you don't even think would maybe be possible. They would be interested in what you're writing or someone else is writing. And, but it makes a difference. So Awesome. Well, what's next for you, Tina? I thought I already answered that. Oh, my we bad. Just want to hear from you again. It's you. It's um, just you, Jamie. It's just me. I got all confused with next Watts. 
<laughs> but anyway, <laughs> what's next for me is that I am going to keep writing my book. I have I have decided I am writing a novel. That is all that I have decided. I have I used to think I would publish it by my birthday. That's still my goal, but I it's soft. It's a soft goal because when I made the goal, I did not realize what I was in for as far as editing. I think maybe now I can reach it because um, I've, I've discussed just on this podcast. My problem is, is having enough story to sustain a novel. And I have that. So I, I have no qualms or concerns other than actually doing the work, which I've been doing. So I wrote a lot of words this week and I'm going to write a lot more in the coming week. And I'm just very excited to be able to report like Gigi that I'm done and can move on. So that's my what's next. What else do we have in the chat? Anything, Jen? I'm sorry. I muted because my daughter is banging around cereal boxes here. Oh. Um, I think we've got everything cleared up except for we've got some people talking about how much they love Christmas. So great. Uh, Piper's also writing Christmas in the story that she's working on right now. So yeah, lots of things going on for everybody. Lots of writing happening. That's exciting for us to see you guys actually getting your writing done. That's exciting. Yeah. Being finished and doing editing. We're excited. Yeah. And if you all... If you all notice a taper off on the Twitter, I'm trying, but now I got edits that I'm doing. So, I mean, I'm doing what I can and we'll see. I mean, our metrics are great for our Twitter, um, for the podcast, but um, I won't be as active as I have been. So I hope you don't miss my multi multiple twits. <laughs> We're getting a lot of traction on Facebook now too. Great. Mm -hmm. It's really ramping up. And we're only doing the effort that we have, guys. We're not trying to get you guys to change your whole life and become only social media all the time. We're trying to show you that just a little bit of effort can really increase um, your exposure. All right. So are all hearts clear? Do we have anything else to discuss? All right. Well, in that case, this concludes this episode of the Christian Indie Writers Podcast. Until next time. May your pen be prolific, may your deadlines be met, and may all of your words honor Christ. Bye now.